Alpha and the Omega that I greet you with grace, mercy, and peace. Let us answer the greeting of the Lord by singing our first hymn, Shall we pray? 
ever creating, ever transforming God from the tops of the hills to the depths of the oceans. Your presence is known throughout the earth. Stretching to the deepest reaches of space, yet closer than the breath in our lungs, we rejoice in your many blessings. You are the guide at our left hand, the shade on our right, so that whenever we walk in dark valleys, whenever we fear the future or are troubled by the past, you are steadfast in your care for us, holding us in the palm of your hand. You made each of us in your image, crafting us from mud and stardust. Yet we can neglect this worth in ourselves, and we can also neglect this worth in others. Lord, have mercy. You do not rest from loving the world, infusing each moment of life with grace. Yet we can become complacent in caring for others and for ourselves. Christ, have mercy. Your concern has always been for the poorest and the outcast, urging us always towards true justice and deep peace. Yet we can worry only about our own interests and our own desires. Lord, have mercy. Loving God, you who bring down the arrogant and who lift up the humble, we thank you for leading us and we thank you for serving us. Please guide our leaders to also be your servants. We thank you for Penny, our safeguarding officer, and for those making this faith community that is our congregation a safe place for all. Please protect the vulnerable amongst us through them and through their care. We thank you, Lord, for our head of state, for her long and her, her long life and her composed demeanor. Please bless her with your grace and your wisdom. We thank you for our various governments that we do not live in dictatorships. Please bless the elected officials to be public servants after your example. We also thank you today that we do not have any wars in and around our continent, at least not now. But things are looking rather ominous, dear God. Please move your people of peace in whichever governments they find themselves to be the peacemakers that you destined them to be. Merciful God, you know our personal weaknesses and our struggles, and you do not hold them against us. As we seek your forgiveness for our own apathy, we ask that you continue to transform our hearts and souls so that we might see with your eyes and love with your heart, seeking always to protect the most vulnerable in the building of your kingdom. For we do so following in the steps of Christ Jesus, our teacher, Savior and Lord, in whose words we share the prayer he taught us to pray. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today is taken from Luke chapter 4, and Linda will do both our scripture readings today. Thank you, Linda. Then Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath, he went as usual to the synagogue. He stood up to read the scriptures and was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me 
because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed and announce that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. All the people in the synagogue had their eyes fixed on him as he said to them, this passage of scripture has come true today as you heard it being read. They were all well impressed with him and marveled at the eloquent words that he spoke. They said, isn't he the son of Joseph? He said to them, I'm sure that you will quote this proverb to me. Doctor, heal yourself. You will also tell me to do here in my hometown the same things you heard were done in Capernaum. I tell you this, Jesus added, prophets are never welcomed in their hometown. Listen to me. It is true that there were many widows in Israel during the time of Elijah, when there was no rain for three and a half years and a severe famine spread throughout the whole land. Yet Elijah was not sent to anyone in Israel, but only to a widow living in Zarephath in the territory of Zidon. And there were many people suffering from a dreaded skin disease who lived in Israel during the time of the prophet Elisha. Yet not one of them was healed, but only Nam, the Syrian. When the people in the synagogue heard this, they were filled with anger. They rose up, dragged Jesus out of town, and took him to the top of the hill on which their town was built. They meant to throw him all over the cliff, but he walked through the middle of the crowd and went his way.
So when I show you this, when I show you this uh, picture, what is it that you see there? An oversized hot cross bun, right? Soda bread. When I was a university student, um, we were often confronted, it was the beginning of the end of the official apartheid system in South Africa. And at the theological seminary, we often had people talking, lecturers, and then we had to think about Bible or bread? Bible or bread? Bread, Bible, Bible, bread. And some people would say, well, you, the one should precede the other one. You cannot have the one without the other one. Or um, why do you want both? Shouldn't it be a, as and when needed, etc.? I'm not going to answer that question. But when you hear Jesus saying, I have come to set the captives free, I have come to bring sight. I have come to write off debts. Depending on which tradition you grew up in, you would either see it as predominantly spiritually flowing into materialistic ends, or you will see it as predominantly practical, everyday liberation, feeding, sight, healing, writing off of debts, but it's, in, it's, it's, it's based on the back of, because the gospel expects that of us. It's very difficult to see it as the same. Hardly ever do people see it's the same thing. It's almost always we will split the two because the one is spiritual and the one is physical, except it's, it's not really the way the Jewish world typically looked at reality. It's very much a Greek split that. It's, it's called a platonic worldview to say, well, spiritual and physical. It's not that easy to split the two. And that is, we have to bear that in mind when we, when we hear Jesus saying, well, I've come to tell you that there is liberation and the writing off of debt and the seeing of, for the blind. And when Jesus then, it's the sound technician sneezing. Uh, so when Jesus then um, explains it, he, he, he contextualizes what he just said to uh, the crowd, they really are up in arms, up to the point where they actually want to kill him. So it's, if I can briefly just uh, highlight a, f a few matters from the text. The one is the context that they were in. So when we, when we look at the context that we see there, the town and the era that Jesus was in was one of, um, I've mentioned this too many times, one, one of being suppressed, one of um, being a, a country where you were subservient to the invaders, to the colonizers, and you were just, you, you had to be grateful for what you had left and you try to cling to your sense of identity and your sense of community, and that became such a strong sense of, of defining your life. And the Jews had to distinguish themselves from the Gentiles, especially in the town where Jesus was having his inaugural service, sermon there. Now, bearing in mind, it's not as a priest, it's as a, um, it's as a rabbi. So this is not the sacrificing temple, this is the teaching church, church, synagogue. So it's a synagogue space. That's where people shared their stories and their wisdom. It was like a school and also to some extent um, like a club and a, a cultural get-together, etc. But the Jews were distinguished from the Gentiles in very clear black and white distinctions. So when Jesus then stands up as one of them, he, he's one of them. He really is an us. And then he says, well, you know what? God really likes everybody, especially the vulnerable ones, even if they are with them and they are not with us. God is more interested in 
the needy ones wherever they are than in us. I'm repeating that. God is more interested. He has a preference to be present with the weak and the vulnerable. God bless you if you understand how weak and vulnerable you are. But if you feel, well, God's bypassing me because I'm not that weak and vulnerable, then you get annoyed with God because it's like a bus driver going past you and you had your hand up. Um, so why is God bypassing you? Well, easy. Um, but the issue here was the Jews and the Gentiles were definitely us and them. To some extent like Palestine today. So, using this image from <laughs> make hummus, not walls, um, from uh, Palestine, um, there's so much apartheid currently going on there. If you were annoyed, if you were really annoyed with apartheid South Africa, and you are not annoyed with apartheid Palestine, I think that's double standards. But I'll just park that there. Now, the second one is the mission. We had just had a look at the context. So it was very much a culturally, nationalistically divided space. The mission was, we had the man there and the mandate. You can't split the two because Jesus says, this has been fulfilled. This messianic expectation of the jubilee year of God, when God shakes everything and it just sorts it out the way it should be. Heaven's coming back to earth or heaven has, the kingdom of God has materialized in this space. Jesus says, this is it. This is now. It, it, it has been fulfilled. It's almost as if Jesus could have gone, Ta -da! and I think when people heard, oh, it's going to happen now, I think they were going like, yes. But when they were realizing in a modest way, he was saying, Ta -da! I think they were like, what an arrogant bloke that is. I mean, we know him. He's Mary's child. Who does he think he is? Now, it's interesting the words that I use there, the Greek words, I have mentioned it here previously, is both they were amazed and they were shocked. And they had to decide on which side of the fence they're going to find themselves in. The man that he then says, and if you're, if you're participating in the Luke uh, Bible study, we'll be picking up on this often. Jesus has a mandate. He says, the Holy Spirit, the Lord, has said to to, this, to me has enabled me through the Spirit to do the following. That's why I am here. So if you're a Christian, if you're following Jesus Christ, take note of what Jesus says he's here for. Not what other people say Jesus says he's here for, but what Jesus says he's here for. This is Jesus saying, I, I am here to do this. Not what John says about me or what other people say about, I'm telling you that this is why I'm here. So he has a mandate, a mandate to write off debt, a mandate to give sight to the blind, a mandate to announce the year of God's grace, a mandate to liberate people. Now, if I were to ask you, where are people in bondage today? Depending on where you move in your world, you might think, well, People might be financially in bondage, or people might be culturally, emotionally in bondage. They can be spiritually in bondage. They can, ha, their health can be in bondage. Um, whatever the level of bondage is of, of, of suppression, you might need to ask yourself, how do you feel about that? H how do you feel about the fact that there are apparently more than 150,000 people modern-day slaves in Britain. You must have heard about this poor person who lived in the backyard of somebody else for was it like 40 years, and he lived in a shed, and he wasn't even really paid a wage. I was shocked. I was more shocked when the BBC News said 150,000 people in the UK are known to be living in, in, in modern-day slavery situations. Now, we might not know about that, and yes, then we don't know about it. One of the questions that the, the children are more uh, primed to nowadays is, so that shoes that, what are you wearing Adidas today, um, John? Uh, yes, yes. Adidas. 
Adidas, right. So how much were the children paid, or the, the, the staff paid that now, you won't know, I don't know either. I'm, I'm wearing some other <laughs> version of whatever. <clears throat> but it's some of the questions that some of the younger people are asking is, I'm consuming a lot of stuff in the West. It's being produced in developing countries. What are they getting for their level of effort? Remember how some of the people living in the mines year and five died of emphysema and lung, whatever, lung diseases, and health and safety eventually caught up and then the, things were better. But for a while it wasn't. Now a lot of stuff that's being produced abroad is still in that space where the health and safety is not there. Um, so when the Chinese have their um, Olympic Games, for instance, we have the Uyghurs, the Muslim group, nation, identity, folk, it would be called in Afrikaans, um, up in China where they are being suppressed terribly so. And some of the sponsors are saying, well, we're going to withdraw from this Olympic Games. Um, I'm lying, they're not. The sponsors don't withdraw because there's too much money in it for them. Unless we as consumers tell them to withdraw. If you tell Coke, listen, I'm going to buy Pepsi for the rest of my life if you continue to sponsor this Olympic Games. Or you might be thinking, oh, and that's just rubbish. It's not rubbish to the Uyghurs. They are still being very, very poorly treated. So there's lots of versions of, of slavery. I can talk the same way about blindness. I can talk the same way about debts, etc. If I were to say, what happened that our electricity bills are going to double? What happened there? Or should I just say, no, it's fine, it's fine. It's one of those things, you know. Except we are producing more than 100% of our electricity needs. But we have to pay for this extra gas expense. Why? I mean, maybe you can afford it, maybe I can afford it, maybe we can't. But there are definitely a lot of people that have to choose between heating and eating this, this, um, this winter. And if they're not doing it now, they will be doing it next winter. It's a matter of justice. But how did we get there? So it's not as if what Jesus was on about has stopped. It really is still a matter of um, debts. It still is a matter of blindness. It still is a matter of oppression. Now, the outcome. Now, the interesting thing with Jesus is uh, the immediate outcome is they want to kill him. The good news is they don't. The bad news is eventually they do. He was really consistent with this. And when they threatened him, he didn't change his tune. When he told them, listen, God blesses everyone, but are we able to bless the foreign one that's struggling, that's not like us, the 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 Gentile that's not a Jew, are we able to stretch our grace that far? And then they wanted to kill him. Now he was rather consistent in the way he cared, and then in Luke especially, you'll find him constantly reaching out to the marginalized people, the people that did not have the opportunities. So the immediate outcome was he was almost killed, and I would like to ask Jesus, if I may, one day when we get there, just, can we just replay that scene? I'm very curious how you got out of that one. Um, but it doesn't say it, and then it wasn't his time, so um, eventually he does. But that also then brings us to our day and age. That sentiment that Jesus had is still part of the church. The church is still involved with sponsoring toilets so that they don't have long drops, they actually have flushing toilets. The church is still involved with making sure that people that cannot gain an income get to have a small loan, interest-free loan, so they can buy a goat, so they can have meat and milk, and they can have a sewing machine, etc., etc. The church is, thankfully, 2,000 years later, still very much involved with that. And we do raise funds for various projects. I, I thank Mike uh, a week or two ago for his involvement with the various projects and leading a lot of our fundraising efforts. And when we have our teas, we often raise funds. We should do that. That's very important. It is who we are, and we should please continue to do that. And it's a privilege to keep doing it, not to be self-centered, but to be altruistic enough to keep doing what Jesus did. Now, I should say, even to the point where it hurts us, even to the point where it hurts us. 
Finally, the challenge is not, it's, there are certain things that are better nowadays, which is a lot to be grateful for, um, but there are certain things that are much more challenging nowadays. I think fewer people on earth have access to clean water or to clean air, um, but thankfully people have more human rights, I think, generally. Now this is, if you have a look at some of the United Nations or the World Bank statistics, they will tell you how significant a percentage of the global population is really just eking out a living. Now it's possible for us not to take note. It's fine in the sense that I don't think anybody's going to blame you, but it's not fine because it's an issue for God. God says, good news to the poor. Um, I have a preferential treatment, a prefer preferential appreciation of people who really are struggling. And so should we. Now, you have the internet at your disposal to have a look. I am just grateful that as part of our Safeguarding Sunday, we can say that we really do try to make sure that it is not so much the powerful that feel at home, but that it's everybody that feels at home. God bless you for the various hospitality groups, the fellowship group, the lunch club, the network, um, the involvement with the dementia group, making sure we have the ability to have a play group, etc. Thank you for what I know about what we're doing, the, the, the care van, etc. But thank you for the stuff you do in your personal capacity, which, yes, your left hand shouldn't be knowing what your right hand is doing. So praise the Lord for whatever you are doing. You are doing God's work by caring and sharing. And also, it is not untoward to do it to the point where it actually costs you something some of your time, some of your energy, some of your whatever, because that's what Jesus did. And then when he says, follow me, we follow him and we dance with him, and that's the way he teaches us to dance, and then we dance with him. Amen. Let us pray. Ever-loving God, Jesus was the personification of compassion, for he saw and understood each person he met. As we pray for ourselves and those around us, Help us to become more compassionate, better able to respond in love to each person we meet. We remember a time when we were scared by the actions of someone else and pray for every victim and survivor of abuse, bullying and concern. We think of the women and girls in our lives who we know and love and pray for the too many who face domestic violence or sexual assault. We call to mind those who love us deeply, all who nurtured and cared for us at different times in our lives, holding them in our hearts with thanksgiving. We call to mind those who have taught us well, particularly those who encouraged us, encouraged us in faith and wisdom, holding them in our hearts with thanksgiving. We call to mind those who tenderly challenge us, who hold us to account and call us to work for justice, holding them in our hearts with thanksgiving. As we give thanks for our personal journeys of safety and growth, we pause to acknowledge with gratitude the many people we do not know who work hard to ensure a safe church for all. We give thanks for the professionalism of our safeguarding service, the dedication of many trainers and coordinators across the church, and all, all who give their time to improve the lives of the most vulnerable. And we give thanks for the people in our own congregation who work hard on our behalf to keep us all safe. We live in a world which is not perfect, holy God, but one which you created and saw was very good. And so there is much in our hearts and minds. We humbly ask you to hear all our prayers this day, whatever they may be, Hear them and hold them tenderly, for we offer them in the power of the Holy Spirit and the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Teach me to walk in the light of your eyes.
the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace. Thank you.